You know, I've mentioned in the past many times, actually, that the Old Testament is just filled with illustrations uh, that help us to understand spiritual truth. There's stories in the Bible of men and women in their lives and how they interact with one another. There's illustrations using different material things like trees and rocks and oil and bread and water and, and just an abundance of these illustrations. Uh, there's a verse in the New Testament that talks a little bit about this that says in 1 Corinthians 10, now these things were done as an example and were put down in writing for our teaching or understanding on whom the last days have come. And one of my personal favorite illustrations in the Old Testament has to do with the Holy of Holies. Uh, you know, the Holy of Holies, many of you are very familiar with this. It was in the tabernacle, and it was the uh, second or the interior part or portion of the tabernacle. And this was left in total darkness, uh, and no one was permitted to enter it except for the high priest, which when it was done, it was Aaron, the high priest, and he could only go in once a year. And the Holy of Holies contained the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, you can read the description of this whole thing. It's in Exodus chapter 25. But on top of the Ark then was this mercy seat. And I've often thought, uh, I'm convinced myself that the reason that it was called a mercy seat and that particular characteristic of God, his mercy, was emphasized here was because when unworthy and unholy man, even the high priest, came in, uh, God, he would have to have God's mercy or he would just be consumed by God's righteousness and holiness. So anyway, uh, the high priest would come in once a year. And the thing that separated this holy of holies from just the holy place was this great, thick, ornate veil that God had given the children of Israel the instructions on how to make this veil. And it kept, it was about, some believe it was at least three feet thick, this veil, and it kept out people, everybody, it was separation, it was the barred all access to the Holy of Holies. And this veil was carried over in Solomon's temple and even down to the day when Christ was on earth, when God became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, there was a veil in the temple at that time. And my favorite part of this whole illustration is when Christ died, a miraculous and mysterious thing happened. We read in Matthew 27, uh, crying again with a loud voice, Jesus released his spirit. He willingly died. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were sheared. And so this illustration shows us that we as Christians now have access to God himself. This signified that the ways open, Christ provided a way for me and you to have direct access to the creator of all the world, and all the universe, of everything. And that's what I wanted to get to now, is what this access means. Uh, we know that part of it includes our inheritance. You can read in, about that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. There's a verse that talks about our inheritance. And we also know that uh, another part of being saved, having access to God, uh, means that we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 30 talks about our spiritual blessings we have. But, but this one truth, the truth that we now have access to God because the way's been opened up, the, the veil's been rent, and once we become saved, we have a, a access. This one truth has actually uh, concerningly become sort of a springboard for a lot of false teaching. There's many people today, I believe that, and I guess there always have been, that teach that salvation through trust in Christ not only pays for our sins, and we are forgiven of our sins and given the righteousness of God and ensured a home in heaven, but it includes uh, physical blessings here on earth. Uh, the label that I would put on this is simply the gospel of prosperity. And you can hear it on the radio, you can see it in cyberspace, on the on videos and so forth, you can see it on television, the tent meetings all over the United States, all over the world, this thing of in churches today also, the prosperity gospel, and the whole crux of this, and, and in a nutshell, is simply this, that God is now your father. You're one of his children. You have access, and he loves you so much that he wants you to succeed. He wants you to be wealthy. He wants you to have success in life and to prosper, and it, it even includes health, your physical well-being. God, they teach, does not want you to be sick. 
God wants his children to be healthy and whole and to have an abundant life here on earth. And uh, I'll probably do another study on this another time, uh, but let me just address quickly this thing of everybody, all Christians should not be sick, but all Christians should be healthy, and God paid for, that by his stripes we're healed, that God wants us to not have sickness in our life. I don't believe that's true, mainly because if you take one of the greatest men of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, and you study his life, and you read uh, in Second, uh, First Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about Paul had this problem, this physical ailment, and he asked God three different times, take it away. And each time God says, no, no, Paul, I won't. But God says, here's what I will do, Paul. Uh, my grace that I offer you freely is sufficient. So God didn't want Paul to be healed then. And I don't think that necessarily it's true that God wants every Christian to, to be healthy. He may want some of them to be healthy some of the time or some all the time, but, but not every Christian all the time to be healthy. Uh, sickness is part of what God has for us in this life. But back to the false teaching here, that God wants us to have everything. There's a myriad of verses that they use, mostly out of context. Uh, for instance, I've heard this verse quoted most often on the television evangelist who uh, promised wealth. They say that in Malachi chapter 3, God says, I am the Lord, all-powerful, and I challenge you to put me to the test, bring the entire 10% of the storehouse so there will be food in my house, and then I, God says, will open the windows of heaven and flood you with blessing after blessing. Another verse that they often use is this one, Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Anything your heart desires, it's yours when you're a Christian. Well, Two thoughts on this verse, Psalm 37, 4. What does it mean to delight yourself in the Lord? Well, to answer that, let me ask you a couple questions here. What is it that really makes you happy? What are some of the things that you absolutely love to do? And every chance you get, you'll, you'll do them. Uh, no matter what, you'll manage somehow to carve some time out of your busy life and your busy schedule and get these things in because they make you happy. You enjoy them. They bring pleasure to you. Some of you might have an answer to this question. Maybe it's uh, play with my iPod, or surf the internet, or get out in the back nine and play some golf, or go fishing, or play football, or watch TV, or read a book, or whatever it is. Uh, and these could be some of the things that you delight yourself in. And so whatever your answer is to that question, uh, whatever gives you the most joy in life right now, the thing that you love to do more than anything, uh, that it's so much fun that that's what you're delighting yourself in. The things that you derive the most pleasure from and that you spend the most time doing, that's where your delight is right now. And on the flip side of that, what are some things that you really dread in life that are just drudgery to you and you hate doing them and they're such a drag and they bore you, uh, they exhaust you, they just wear you out, they drain you. Some of you might feel <laughs> that way about maybe Bible study or prayer, or fellowship, or going to church. Uh, so I think you get the idea where I'm going with this. So what are you delighting yourself in? Is it the Lord? Well, the verse goes on and says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Now, a lot of people, I don't think that's exactly what he means here, that he'll give you anything your heart desires. For me, all this verse is saying is that God will not give you uh, what you want, whatever your heart desires, but he'll give you the desires themselves. He'll put desires in your heart. Uh, he'll give you his own desires. He'll give you the things that he longs for, and that what he longs for and loves to do and wants to see accomplished, that'll become your desires and your goals. And if you find that you just don't honestly have that strong uh, desire to spend hours in prayer or study the Bible or spend time in church or whatever it is, uh, maybe it's because you're delighting yourself in the wrong things. So to close, real quickly, if, if you're finding that the things that you want most and the things that you spend most of your time trying to, to become or to achieve or to acquire uh, are actually not God's pursuits, then, then you need to change that. And once you start delighting yourself in the Lord, then he, in turn, will give you certain desires in your heart that will cause you to have desires that are 
proper and godly and what he wants for you. And it's just, it's kind of strange. It's almost like a cycle. And it's a perpetually feeding thing. The more you delight yourself in the things of the Lord, the more he gives you desires or the, the, the things in your heart that makes you want to want the right things. And it'll just keep on growing and growing and growing. I trust that I've made this clear enough and that you understand it. I know I've kind of wandered a little bit here, but uh, maybe this will be a blessing to your heart. Thanks a lot. I'll see you next time.